to the bald box. And today here, I have, again, personal friends, man. You know, like, all my friends are bald. No cap. No cap. No No cap. No cap. No cap. I'm Kuchini. But anyway, um, <laughs> to my right is uh, an industry guru, man. Like, hey, Faki, please introduce yourself in the best way you know how. Okay. Okay. My name is Faki Liwali. Um, now I call myself a creative entrepreneur and talent and business manager. Um, I've been an uh, events and uh, artist manager for a while, and now I'm venturing into film and TV. Yani, would you say you're managing Nyash? Nilikuwa na manage Nyash. Eh, but I never thought you were Faki, by the way, I knew Faki. I read him in the papers, and then I uh, experienced him when he was managing Nyashinsky. When Nyashinsky came back, before Nyashinsky left, I was. Uh, <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> but when he came back, at least I had access, man. Mm-hmm. And uh, I saw you working with Nyash and just restoring his brand in the market. Mm-hmm. You guys did such an amazing job. Thank you. No easy feat. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, especially with how Nyash is as a person. You know, mm-hmm. like Nyash will not do an interview. Mm-hmm. And you know, that's a very long term strategy because mm-hmm. it's working for him now. Yeah. But at the time, you had to put out so many fires. Mm-hmm. You guys did a fantastic job. Mm-hmm. I've seen you also in many other forums fighting Kenyan fights for fighting fights for Kenyan artists. Mm-hmm. So, man, mad respect. Asante, Asante. Yeah, man. Mm-hmm. And uh, to my left, man like Solo. Mm-hmm. Solo, you introduced to. Come on, Mesema. Mm, introduce yourself. Solo. Mm-hmm. My name is Solomon Wangwe. I am a um, native Kenyan, uh, uh, passionate about uh, all things uh, property. I, I run a small but fast-growing business called Goshen Acquisitions and a sister company called Grand Acres Limited, which is uh, mainly focused on providing Kenyan safe land investment opportunities. Hey, so how did I meet Solo? Solo walked into my life and Solo by the way for the last uh, two years in this COVID time I think the universe sending you my way was one of if not the biggest blessings like you opened up another side of success to me that I can't really explain Solo introduced me to our business coach Solo introduced me to our life coach introduced us to our business coach introduced us to our life coach uh solo made us land owners you know and uh solo in that way i mean like i'm so grateful you have a big brother presence in my life that is vital man you know like you stick it out for the gang you've been there for Softy soul for all of us in a family way not even at uh, with because of business so soul and goshen acquisitions is family so thank you very much for coming yeah, today. To hear that, Even man. you coming here today, I know you have things to do, places to be. You guys are very, very busy people. So I wouldn't take much of your time. So today we're going to talk about money. And I know like both of you are gurus in that area of money because growing up, money was always a very foreign object to me. Uh, in our house, we didn't have much of it for most of my life. So I want to talk about how Africans, first of all, relate with money. Like growing up, how do you guys relate with money? Faki, hey. you want to go first? Money was for grown-ups. <laughs> money was for grown-ups. Yeah. Money was for grown-ups yeah. and it was a favor for, for, for us kids. Um, and to betray my age now, I used to go to, when, when I was young, we used to go to Madrasa because I'm Muslim. And... Um, for break time, and so that you know how old I am, for break time, my dad used to give us one shilling each for break. And just so that you can feel like you have a lot of money, we used to change it into five cent coins. So you'd walk around with yeah. 20 coins mm-hmm. and feel like you're really rich. And you know, at that time, you used to be able to buy like a handful of peanuts for 10 cents and a mandazi or something for 10 cents. So... Money was a big thing, but also my dad uh, taught us uh, lessons about money. Uh, so, for example, um, I moved from 
a um, middle school milimani primary school to a school um that was lower uh but much higher in in academics that's olympic mm-hmm. primary mm. and when we moved the fees that we were paying were was like it was such a reduction in the amount of fees we were paying so what my dad did was and i discovered this by mistake when one day a teacher gave me a receipt was i discovered that my dad was paying for like 20 something kids uh school yeah. fees and then of course i had to ask like why can't they pay for themselves you know mm-hmm. and he had to take me through this lesson of the money that you see in the house which is not much there's other people who don't have that kind of money mm. and because education is important then we help them out like that so for me it taught me um money comes with responsibility mm-hmm. um in terms of taking care of 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 your environment people around you your community mm. another lesson that i talk about is um again when i was growing up my sister was in college and um she used to go to college i think it was between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. in town um that time i think i was still in school and my dad used to give her exact fare you know cuz thing is by the time you've left home you've had you've done you had your breakfast yeah by the time you leave school it's time for you to go home and you can have lunch so there's no need for anything in between so she used to be given 16 shillings cuz bus fare was 8 shillings one way you know we were living in fort jesus kibira at that time so 8 shillings to town 8, eight shillings, shillings back. back you know and is that why kibira is called number 9 yeah ah. <laughs> and All on right. this and, and 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 on this particular day cuz he used to he used to have like a handkerchief that had coins so he used to count <laughs> in particular like he used to be very particular so he used to count 16 shillings and this one day he didn't have as much coins and he left 20 shillings and you see we only saw it when we woke up cuz he had already gone to work so my sister went and came back and bought us maize and you know goodies you know yeah only for us to wake up the next day and my dad had left 12 shillings. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is militant. Yeah, so. I love that, man. Yeah, so really tight from from growing up. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And I like I like that you have clear, you know, moments in your life when mm. you've been taught lessons mm. growing up. And these are not lessons about do not steal. Mm. You know, these are lessons about virtue. <laughs> yes. About how to live your life and how to save and all of this. Yeah. What about you solo? Uh wow. Well, this this is actually an issue I have reflected on uh, before. So you have PTSD for cash. <laughs> <laughs> we are in a manner of speaking, although you know, as Faki said, it's always relative because there's always people far worse off than you are. Mm. No matter how bad it gets, mm. and no matter how good it gets, there's always people bawling. Mm. You know, in ways that you can't even think of. But, you know, honestly, for, for myself and my two sisters, I have two younger sisters, but we're close, there's two, two years between us, so it's not a big gap. Um, we, in my view, had a really privileged upbringing. We grew up mm. in Langata, basically, Rubia Estate, because uh, my dad worked for Gava, my mom worked for the ICRC. Mm. Uh, for like 11 years or so, you know, through, throughout my, my teens, uh, pre-teens into, into high school, basically. And, you know, we went to decent schools. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't mention the one you expect me to mention. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, went, I went to Alliance. Oh, yes, there you go. <laughs> well, it, it's not a foregone conclusion. There is no other Alliance. So. <laughs> <laughs> but for the benefit of, of uh, random people, I went to the Alliance. Wow. <laughs> uh, I made it in by a whisker. What's a whisker? I almost two didn't marks. get in, yeah. I, I think actually I, I missed a cutoff by two or three marks. Ish. And my, my folks did a lot of lobbying. Lobbying? To, to What's get lobbying? Back. So lo- lobbying in America is corruption. Yeah, well, 
I, I have no proof. Okay. Uh, I, I do know that uh, an aunt of mine who was a headmistress of, uh, I think it's Joy, Joyland or Joy School for the, for the Deaf mm -hmm. in Thika, had a relationship with the headmaster at Alliance High School. And she paid, played a really big role in uh, convincing them to let me let the guy squeeze come. in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, you know, I guess they were colleagues in, in the industry. So she was a headmistress there, so yeah. I, I managed to get in. But, you know, all the way through college. So uh, in, that, in that respect, we, we lacked for nothing. But, but money was never really discussed, at least not with the kids. Mm. Um, it wasn't until I was 24... 25 before I actually started thinking about budgeting mm -hmm. like no one had ever taught me how to budget money you know money because there's the one you're taught in class like how to budget in business education and mm -hmm. all of that yeah in but theory there needs to be in theory because you don't have the money in hand mm -hmm. yes yeah and, and my folks never I guess it never felt like they needed to teach us because Whatever we needed, you know, we had yeah. decent food to eat. We had a roof over our heads. We were going to school, uh, and I think I think that's a, I think it, it it needs to be different, and that's a, that's something I've observed now, you know, as an adult about other communities, mm -hmm. you know, the Asian communities, uh, the Israeli, the, Jew, the Jewish yeah. communities, even the Somali community. You know, the kids, mm -hmm. at least the guys I know. They're, they're put in it early. Mm -hmm. You know, you know how to budget, you know, you know, I know the Jews, for instance, when they turn 13 or 12, bar mitzvah, mm -hmm. uh, in some communities in the States, the kid actually gets uh, accounting and check writing authority. Mm -hmm. It's just that the dad has to sign. Okay. Yeah, but, you know, I know a guy who, when suppliers would come for payment, uh, he tell them, yeah, go talk to the kid, he's back there, he'll write your check, and then bring it, I sign. So the kid, from a very early age, understood wow. money, commerce, buying, selling, which, in hindsight, for me, I feel was a major handicap, because mm -hmm. I, I did dumb stuff Damn. with money mm -hmm. uh, yeah. earlier. I still do every now and then, <laughs> <laughs> if I'm to be honest, but uh, we've come a long way. Is there really dumb stuff with money? That's Plus, the question. you can afford it. I, I mean, honestly, uh, I don't think anyone can ever afford to do dumb stuff with money. Uh, and I'm sure my wife will disagree. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I have learned some things along the way that, mm. you know, hard lessons I think could have been avoided had I had exposure early. Yeah. You know, if, if, if parents take time when kids are young to teach them what, what the value of money is, where does it come from? How do you keep it? Yeah. More importantly, how do you grow it? Wow. Yeah. Because uh, those are two different things. Yeah. How do you keep your money and how do you grow your money? Yeah. So um, my relationship with cash growing up was so, so cryptic. My mother would only give me money for things that to go and buy something. So go and buy uh, bread, go and buy milk. And I was given bus fare to go to school. But I was never given an allowance. Okay, a lunch money, yes, in school and all that. But I was never given an allowance and money was so taboo. Like, my dad would even give you cash from his pocket. Mm. Like, <laughs> you know, yeah. stealing was the only relationship my parents ever... The only time my parents spoke to me about money was when telling me not to be a thief. Mm. Like, stealing was a big no in our house. I, I stole 10 but one day I nearly died. Like, I <laughs> remember what I did, yeah. Oh, well, you thumped. I, I, I was beaten, like, to a pub. <laughs> I, 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 went to, I went to buy uh, Ko and Patco, like, in 5x5 five five Bob, and they were 50 cents each. And, yeah, I had so many sweets. So my mom, when I came back home in the <laughs> evening, my, my grandma was like, why is your pocket so, like, bulgy? And I had all these sweets, and then there were all these questions of, where did you get that money, you know? And even, like, I, when I had money that I'd found in school, when maybe I placed, I, I, I placed a bet with someone, I'll beat you in math, I'll beat you in English, then I win, and I have 50 bob mm. or 20 bob. I had to explain where I got it. I had to explain that I didn't steal. Right. It wasn't like, how did you make that money? Accountability, man. Account yeah. yeah, it's important. Yeah. In high school, uh, there's a friend of mine, I won't mention his name, he's a dad now. But uh, there was a full-blown business of just piercing people's ears. Wow. 
and uh, it was 50 bob. It was like something that guys were doing in class. Uh, we sold biscuits in class, you know, Sheesh. but I feel all my attempts of business just because I, I figured I didn't have home training in on money skills. Mm. Like I tried to sell biscuits, I ate my stock. <laughs> I, <laughs> I just did the dumb shit. But now that <laughs> you guys are done, <laughs> so, so even growing up, I did more dumb shit with money. You can imagine as a musician, it's not that you, you make your money quick. Mm. And people like to say it's for a season, but me, I'm here for the long, for the long game. I've invested a, a, season, a lot of yeah. money in my, in my uh, craft, but I have made dumb money mistakes. Mm-hmm. I still make dumb money moves at 33. So You're what are you guys dude. telling? Yeah, man, I'm 33. Sheesh. Hey, fuck so you. Like Don't make, even stab. <laughs> so I can make dumb money moves. Well, yeah, not really. Yeah, not really. Yeah. Uh, now, now, like things are getting serious, you know. Yeah. And I just want to ask you, like, what are you telling your kids about money? How are we changing this narrative around parenting and money? It's a it's a difficult thing to do because mm. there is the usual. Um, I don't know if you to call it a need or a want, um, to want to give your kids what you have. didn't have, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. So you, 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 your kid asks you for, can we eat from KFC today? And you know the line of there's rice at home? Yeah. But at the same time, you're like, no, that's mean. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to be able to give him yeah. that because maybe at that point I can afford it. But then there comes a time when you actually don't have that money and you're like, um, we don't have that money right now. Um, when we get it, we'll get to that. Because I had started this bad I habit. I had that a lot in my house. We don't have money right now. I had that a lot. <laughs> yeah. I'd started this bad habit of, and especially when I was in employment, yeah. so there was always a guaranteed check. Um the, there's things that you'd start doing and then they become a, they become a thing in the house without you knowing. So, yeah. for example, we'd always have takeout every weekend, you know. Mm. So at some point then, dad, where are we getting takeout from this weekend? You're like, um, we don't have money for that. But when we get it, you know. Mm. Um, so it's a difficult thing, especially right now, because also our kids are exposed to so much. And it takes some time before you start explaining to them that, you know, um, what I was doing last year or last year but one is not the same as what I'm doing now. Mm. So at least, say, for example, for my son, I'm able to explain to him and tell him, my son is 13. Okay. So I'm able to explain to him, you see, you remember this project that was keeping me busy at this and this time? It gobbled up a lot of money. So I don't have the money we used to have before. So just be patient it will come. Mm. So that now starts the lesson. Then um, even just, I think my wife is better at this because um, she actually just says it like our folks used to say it, I don't have money, you know. Mm. For me, I find myself trying to explain why I don't have the money. But for her, she's, Mm. I don't have money. And it ends there, you know. So I think that balance is important, but we still need lessons every day. What are you teaching your kids about saving? What are you teaching your kids about investment? So for my son, my daughter is a bit too young still. For my son, um, I, we, opened for, we opened for him an, a bank account, you know, like the junior bank accounts. Yeah. Then you have situations where you go visit uh, relatives or, you know, yeah, uh, they grand, the cash. grandparents, they give him cash. So you take away that cash and you say, I'm going to put it in there. Ah, no, no, I don't trust you, man. <laughs> no, but... This seems like something that happened to me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it happened to all of us, dude. No, you see, but, but now here's the thing. So what my son does is he has these things that he does online. Mm. Um, gaming. Like gaming and yeah. things like that. So at some point, there's something that he has to pay for or to buy. Upgrade, yes. And it needs, like, say, two, three hundred bob. So he says, can you use part of my savings to buy this? Yes. And I'm like, yeah, I've been caught, you know, so yeah, I have to do it. <laughs> but at least he just, he knows what he is knows important for me is yeah. he knows there's some money saved for him somewhere mm-hmm. and he can decide to take it. So sometimes I even tell him, okay, I won't use your savings. I'll buy it for you mm-hmm. so that you don't waste. So my lesson hopefully is mm-hmm. 
this is not what you use savings for. All right. Yeah. Hey, all right. So low. What are you telling so low? So low by there has three adorable kids. I know them all. Yeah. Uh, what are you telling so low about money? Solo is not yet interested in learning about money. Pendo is, you know, okay. Pendo is eight now. And uh, I once promised her last year that instead of asking me for money, she should ask me to teach her how to make her own. Mm -hmm. So she's been asking. And now I'm in that uncomfortable space where I need to figure out how to teach her mm -hmm. at her level what money is, where, you know, how, you, how you make it and, and everything that goes along with it. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a struggle because communicating with them at their level takes a, um, requires a lot of awareness, just presence. Mm. Like it's not something, you know, like Faki said, most of us, we used to hear that in the house, that there's no money. Mm. There's no money right now for that. I have been very deliberate never to let those words come out of my mouth. Because, uh, you know, I believe they become self-fulfilling you know, fulfilling prophecies. Mm. Um, so I, I, I prefer to be thoughtful about how I respond. Um, without a doubt, you know, traumas from childhood, you want to fix them. <laughs> uh, you want to spoil your kids, man. Yeah. You're like, hey. like me and toys, I, I hardly ever got toys bought for me. The only toys I ever had that I remember having were from kids in the neighborhood oh or cousins who let me have, have theirs. Yeah. Or maybe a couple I had stolen, you know, <laughs> <laughs> when no one was looking. Yeah. Uh, it was, just wasn't a priority for my folks for some reason. I remember asking them to buy me a soccer ball when I was 13, 14. And I was really good at soccer. I think... Well, I, I like to think I, that uh, I could have, I, uh, yeah, I'd be in Premier League, dude. I'd be earning, you know, whatever, 40 million bobs a week. Mm. But uh, my dad played me. He promised he'd finally buy me a ball. We made a date because he used to come home for lunch every day. He said, tomorrow when I come for lunch, be ready. Because when I go back to the office, we'll go together to Tao and I buy you a ball. And man, I could, I could hardly sleep that night. Uh, he showed up as usual for lunch <clears throat> and uh, I was ready. I went to use the washroom before we bounced. <laughs> While I was in there, he ponyokad. Ah. I, I chased after him. I have, <laughs> I have wounds from that situation, <laughs> which, which, which actually addressed with my dad uh, maybe four or five years ago, if he remembers. You, uh, you, uh, so you addressed this with your dad? For real, dude. Because uh, yeah, you yeah, know yeah, why? Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I didn't want to carry that baggage into my into fatherhood. Your kids, yeah. Um, and you know, so I was telling him, Dad, by the way, me I have a scar that day you in, my, in my in my in my heart when you played me, uh, and I've never owned a soccer ball. Imagine that until mm. until now when I'm buying them for my kids, mm. and you know, being aware of 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 issues from your past around money, mm -hmm. how it was made, how it was spent, I think is the first step to being responsible with it now. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you, you, you keep repeating cycles. Yeah, there's a poverty cycle, man, especially with black tax mm -hmm. and, 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 and being African and having to sort your family out, but also having to progress as a family. Because, you know, like, I figure out some of my friends are from, from certain communities their parents don't ask them for cash the same way my parents would, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And I realized that we have to break that cycle. I like what you're saying about not carrying those, you know, Yeah, because it mm -hmm. happens with everything. Into your new life. Mm -hmm. Because it, yeah. I, I have trauma, man. I, like, I even realized my relationship with money up until I met my life coach is weird. I'm scared to make a lot of money because I'm scared I'll lose it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are, and, but they don't know. Like, tell me about owning property and acquiring wealth. Like, what's the best approach for someone who's just looking to start? I'll ask you solo because you're deep in the property yeah. game. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to start owning property. Do I need to be a billionaire? Do I need to make a... I don't know. It helps if you are, but... It, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it does. I mean, <clears throat> I think... I always tell guys, just be clear that you want to in the first place. And then why? Why do you want to start? 
you know the why is super important you can i can't overstate that <clears throat> and if you're not aware then you find yourself screwing up and making mistakes or, or going in the wrong direction so you have to be very clear about why and the answer is no you don't need to have billions or, or even millions um you know for instance my my relationship with land and land investment you know kenyans are i think kenyans are uniquely addicted to this whole thing of owning land mm. in, in ways that i haven't seen in any other culture so far mm. um <clears throat> and i think there's reasons for that it's it's historical it's cultural you know we, we've discussed it before our colonial history yeah. and and how that basically redistributed land after independence and and the mental shift that our f- folks for instance you know we don't think about it uh, and you forgive me for going into a historical you know Just outline mm. but uh you know i grew up watching my mom mostly my mom buying plots or talking about plots with her friends buying land a couple of times she would take us with her friend mm. uh mrs morioki who is like a sister to my mom uh yeah, i pray my daughter you know grows up to be a mrs morioki uh in her adulthood because she she's a boss lady when it comes to investment and money mm. so i watched my mom interact with her and I didn't understand why. So, you know, we grow up, we start making money, and the first thing you want to do when you're stable, um, maybe looking to get married or you're married is I need a plot of land. There's social pressure somehow to own land, mm-hmm. have a title in your name, mm-hmm. uh, and not the one that you're going to inherit, the one that you've bought it's yourself. Yours. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there's something about that, and I think we don't really think about why that is. Mm-hmm. And you know, being in the business it's something I I try to understand, the psychology mm-hmm. around why we interact our, with our customers. You know, Kenya was colonized up until 1963. everything in Kenya within its boundaries belonged to the queen of yeah. England mm. I, and I, I know I shared, shared this with you before I saw a, a title deed for a, pro, a plot in CBD mm. my lawyer asked me once if I was interested I was just starting with my land investment journey and this thing was on sale for 200 million bobs wow and I was like god bless this guy for thinking I had 200 million bobs <laughs> <laughs> uh but he shared a copy of the title with me and it said it had the history of ownership the lease certificate mm. the ones you most most properties in cbd will be under and it, this one actually started from 1952 it said her majesty the queen of england elizabeth ii whatever so you bring that one in mike to the queen no so it had a history of ownership oh history mm. of ownership so you could see yeah mm, how you could see how it passed on from her mm. to government of kenya in to 1963 mm. to blah 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 to whoever owned it at the time that it was on, uh, on the market for for sale mm. and that was a reality until 1963 we don't really think about what that meant for mm. our grandparents and our great grandparents mm. you know they grew up watching white the white man show up take their ancestral lands yeah they thought the land was a cryptic concept to like how the how the white men were like sharing the land or just doing stuff with our land like that was as cryptic as cryptocurrency to us right now you know like True, yeah. the way you're thinking hey, what the hell is crypto mm. that's how it was yeah like, i mean that's, that's what it's very enough for of us to you know say this is my land we moved we did different things yeah it was ours it was ours it was our mm. land mm. it wasn't yeah, it was it was nature's mm. nobody like said you, you built a homestead for a moment and then you moved mm. Yeah, you moved or you shared the pastures with other communities, mm-hmm. you know. So, but so like I want to buy land now. Give me the process for somebody who's listening and they're young and they want to buy land. Even if it's a 50 by 100 somewhere, like what's the safest way to do it and what what are the do's and don'ts? Do we we'll need like 3 weeks for That's that? That's 3 weeks. Let me ask another question then. But guys, like so low, are you telling guys to buy land by the way? Are you telling guys that we should buy land? Because I have a personal target of having a piece of land every year until I'm maybe what? Yeah, Absolutely, I yeah. I mean, is buy it a, as is much it a viable as you investment? can. A hundred percent. I mean, it's the safest investment, number one, because it's an immovable asset. Mm-hmm. You can't move, you can't pick up land and put it on a track and bounce. Yeah. It's always going to be there. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Number one. Number two, in, in Kenya's history, no other asset class has performed as well as land okay. on a year-on-year -year basis. Mm. So it's a no-brainer. You have to have a portion of your portfolio, if you want to think about it, your investments, whether you have savings, stock market, crypto, whatever, you have to have a certain percentage in land. Uh, for me, the magic number is 30, 33% of your long-term savings or holdings mm -hmm. has to be in land. Okay. Otherwise, you're losing the plot. I tell guys all the literally. time. Yeah, <laughs> literally. <laughs> literally, I mean, there's, there's less than five or six acres of land for every human being on the planet today. If you to, to subdivide the, Equally. all the land on the planet today into plots and give every human being a plot, each of us gets less than five or six acres. Now, majority of that is uninhabitable. It's either snow cap, Antarctica, yeah. or Sahara Desert, or Aussie, whatever. Those who get the usable land, it's even worse. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, and and we're we're increasing in population. So by by nature, mm. it's going to be a, a more difficult uh, thing to get in the future. So you want to get your piece now. Mm. I have more than five six acres. So someone's going without theirs. Mm. Yeah. You uh, you want to get yours now, mm. if you can. Faki, do you have anything to tell the artists who are on the come up? about their investment in property like should artists consistently always invest in property what do you think about that i think generally it's a safe bet like he says um and it will always almost always if not always keep appreciating so it's always it, it will always be something to fall back on as bad as that sounds um but i like what he said about the why um we we need to answer that question why mm. so you can't just be going and buying buying. <laughs> buying just because you hear these because i am a victim of not asking why i have a piece of land somewhere where You've never seen either. we've attempted like three times to go and check it out and we get somewhere and the cars can't get there and the guy tells us you no, see that just, please uh, uh. that's where it is you know but <laughs> it's by the time we were buying it was it was I was I was I was working in corporate, so it was almost pocket mm. change, you mm. know. So you don't really care about it. But I like the why, especially because um, if I can use even me as an example, I have a dream of creating a certain facility, and I know where I want to create that facility. So if you ask me, if you see me buying land in a certain place, then I can give you my why. Mm. of buying that land yeah. in that particular place. You know, this issue of, of specifically 50 by 100s, because, mm. you know, in Kenya, when you say plot, people understand that to be a 50 yeah. by 100. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, unless you, you're buying it in a place that's fully serviced with infrastructure mm. and amenities, mm. I, you know, there's no point. Mm. Um, you, you're basically buying what is essentially a seed for a future slum. Mm. Yes, I understand it's affordable. Yeah. The price point is good. Mm. Makes it easier for the youth especially to afford it. Mm. But if you don't understand why, you mm. find yourself buying stupid things like that. Mm. Uh, just because it has a title also doesn't mean anything really. Yeah. yeah. Mm. You know, so the, the why is super, super important mm. and you know, it, it's something I always encourage people mm. to be clear about before they make a move. Otherwise, mm. you're better off just leaving your money in the account. Yeah. I know a lot of guys today, especially the older generation, extremely wealthy in terms of asset value, mm. but they're cash poor. Mm. Yeah. A guy owns, uh, you know, for for instance, in Imbuko, where we're now neighbors, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, we, have a, we have a neighbor who is constantly asking me to sambaza him a hundred bob, you know, every other weekend for, for credit. Mm. And, and this guy is sitting on like five, six hundred acres. Wow. Damn. And I'm telling him, boss, you, you are so rich. Mm. You should be sending me a shoebox of cash every Sunday yeah. with a note saying, happy Sunday, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, mm. but uh, this issue of owning land for the sake of owning land has to be rethought. Mm. Uh, you have to be strategic about it. You need to get advice mm -hmm. and counsel yeah. about where to buy it and, mm -hmm. and understand why you're buying it. Otherwise, you end up like the guy who's sitting on, you know, by market value, $6 million today, mm -hmm. but he doesn't have a hundred bob for credit. Oh. 
which which is just insane when mm. you think about it. So it's actually mm. important to be cash rich as well. Being cash, being liquid is, an, is a very... Absolutely. Mm. So investments for me, I'm a land guy, but investment for me is has to be diversified. Yeah. You know, we have some land, mm -hmm. uh, you have savings in the in the bank, mm -hmm. you own some crypto. How much how maybe. much of your how much of your income should you save? How much of your income? As yeah. much as you can, man. Uh, my target is 50%. 50%. 50. So yeah. Under the decision I love it. Man. <laughs> Either I, <laughs> You know, we are taught uh, the basic 10%. Mm. Um, 10%? That's, yeah. good. That's not tight. You see, <laughs> there is also, there's also um, I'm forgetting the phrase, there's also uh, living a valuable life. Because um, what's, what's the quality use of, of life? Yeah. Quality of life, yeah. especially. Mm. Exactly. So, um, Yes, it's good to save, but also you need to live. Because mm. as much as life is the longest thing on earth, life is short. <laughs> like anything can happen, you know. Yeah. So you, you, you need to enjoy balance, life yeah. while taking care of um, the future. One of my uncles who's a banker told mm. me that it's actually nice to save a third of everything you earn. Mm. If you save a third of everything you earn, you'll be wealthy. Mm. But if you save fifty percent, you'll mm. be wealthier. Mm. Okay, so let's <laughs> let's break that down honestly, because you know we we throw these numbers around and we don't really boil it down to yeah. practical. Mm. So if you're gonna save a third of everything you earn, mm. assuming you're earning a hundred k a month, mm. that's thirty k. That's thirty k. Mm. But before you could even touch the thirty k, mm. KRA is supposed to keep thirty. Exactly. So you're really you're working with sixty k. Yeah. So if, if you're going to pay your taxes and save 30%, you have 30K to work with. Can you live the kind of life you believe to be yeah. a quality life on that? So those are the questions that should be asked as opposed to what percentage. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I don't think, and this is a mistake, Theor theoretical studies make, yeah. like you know, learning budgeting in, in primo. Yeah. Those percentages don't make sense mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. And I think that needs to be approached differently. Mm. Fantastic. Like, yeah, and, and, and speaking of uh, living a quality life, mm. I don't think the question is, how do I live on 30K? Mm. The question should be, how do I make more? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and this touches on the issue, I was, the point I was trying to make, I never tell my kids there's no money for that. Even mm. though it, it may be true, mm. I never let those words come out. I'd mm. rather ask myself. Mm. Even with them, sometimes I'm like, so how do we, how do we make it possible to buy you this thing? Mm. And, then, and then hopefully you can force some creativity around mm. increasing your, your, your income. Mm. Is, 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 a, is increasing income a creative skill much as, a, as it is a... a, you know, a how can I say this? It's theoretically and it's numbered and it's structured. But you also have to be creative to make money, right? A million In percent. Yeah. In today's world especially, you have to be. Mm. Yeah. yeah, you have to be. I have a question about insurance. <laughs> insurance policy. And what to insure, what not to insure. How many times have you paid insurance and then nothing <laughs> has happened? How many times have you not paid insurance and something has happened? Like, how do you balance insurance in your life? And life insurance and savings and all of those you know, things? You know, you know, you know, when you talk about insurance, my first, my first thought is, is, um, is towards a car insurance. And there was a time when I was struggling to pay my car insurance and a friend of mine who's in the insurance business told me something. Um, like, do you know a lot of the big cars you see on the road are on third-party insurance and not necessarily comprehensive insurance? And when you look at the cost difference between the two, it's huge. It's huge. So it's, it's about, am I ready just in case I have to sort out something to do with my car mm. by having third-party insurance? And I've had... I've had instances where I've done third-party insurance for like three years and I never had any like, incident. No, no, I'm getting too cocky like, now. 
You know? no, I was, no, I was like, I was like, I was yeah. like, wow, it's working. Yeah. But what's important is also knowing your lifestyle, your everyday moves. For example, if you're someone who um, always has to work at night or driving during dangerous hours or using dangerous roads, then of course, comprehensive insurance is for you. Mm. But if you work home, school for the kids, supermarket, home, and then like me, you're a teetola, then... Yeah, you don't need, if I don't even drink. Yeah, so... Solo doesn't even drink. Solo, Solo only drinks very expensive things. Mm. Ah, dude, come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you know, my experience with insurance, I think, is it's important to pay insurance. Like, um, we've... Uh, most of the moments, the moments in my life when insurance has come through for me, especially mm. for my parents now, mm. that they're aging, like, if I didn't have health, insurance... Health insurance, yeah. Health, yeah. Health, yeah. health insurance, mm. to be precise. Mm. If I didn't have health insurance for my parents, mm. I, I don't even know how I would manage. Mm. I try as much as possible to take insurance for Soul Generation, the organization, so that mm. even my kids in the label mm. have some form of cover, you know, mm. to the most basic one. Mm. In, in the African context, honestly, in my, in my humble opinion, it's a matter of demographics and income groups. Like, you know, if, if, you're, if you're talking about domestic workers who maybe are taking home 15, 20K, mm. you can't have a conversation about around, insurance, ab yeah. around insurance. Now, if you're making income above, and this has my, been my experience over the last, you know, how many years now? About 15 years. As income goes up, um, as, as your liabilities increase, whether it's you know, you own more cars or you're borrowing certain sums of money uh, as investments for your business. Like, it's no longer a question of if, it's like how much. Yeah. You know, for instance, for us, what, you know, we borrowed money for a certain project and the group of uh, lenders required because of the sum of money we, we required because we're buying land, which is inherently expensive, we had to take out key man insurance uh, for the business mm. so that should anything happen to me or whoever is responsible for uh, cycling out of that uh, asset, they're made The investment whole. is insured. Yeah, yeah it's, it's insured. So, you know, as, as you progress in life, I think, then it becomes necessary. It's no longer a question of if. Mm. You just need to decide which one's best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Only 2% of Kenya is insured. <clears throat> that includes all the cars you see on the street. Mm. Only 2% of Kenya is insured. Mm. If there's anybody who can come up with any innovation that can raise that number by 1%, you become a billionaire immediately. You know, the, one of the challenges we have, and especially I'll talk about health insurance, one of the challenges we have with um, the insurance sector, and this I'm speaking generally, we have a situation whereby even the insurance industry is not helping to raise that number. Yeah. Because so you have you have quite a number of people who see the value of getting insurance, even as insurance as simple as NHIF, that is should be affordable to uh, many people. But the people who run the insurance uh, schemes. They even call schemes like that's mm. such a bad word. <laughs> the people who run the insurance schemes are always looking for a way to get out of responsibility. So there's always an announcement that, oh, now we are not covering this. Now we are not covering this. Um, even with the National Health uh, Insurance Fund, there's, you'll always hear of a scandal of this COVID. and this and this. So as much as people want to, we're not able they're to not, trust. Yeah. Yeah, because they just want, they, they're really thinking about the profits mm. more than anything. Yeah. Damn. Mm. I, you guys are both married. I know. Mm. And uh, the topic of money in marriage mm. is, can be a gray area and should be transparent. But in some marriages, it's not. Especially now, I see a lot of my friends who are married, but their wives don't really know their financial situation. Mm. You know, mm. my wife didn't know my financial situation for a long time. We had to have hard money conversations mm. for her to at least even be in tune mm. with what my money situation looks like. Mm. I have relatives 
who some of my uncles their families don't even know what they do for a living mm. and they don't know how much property they have mm. you see guys passing away and leaving huge amounts of wealth that's when you discover ah yeah who my dad was this wealthy mm. so like in marriage between you and your spouse what's money supposed to be like in that setting i'm only married 18 months <laughs> <laughs> only yeah Congrats, man. That's thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, and twelve hours. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I met a guy last week who was married for exactly one month. Um, and got divorced. So eighteen, eighteen months. Wow, one wow. month. Ah, what Jamal to enjoy, man. As we talk, Jamal is going to get to Kuja. Yeah. So congrats. Mm. Uh, you have you have any thoughts on that one? That's a sticky one. It's, a, it's, it's, a, a, it's, it's sticky. It's, it's tricky. Mate, do you talk to your wife about the financial situation of everything? But oh, is there that whole thing where like for patriarchy, as a dude, you also don't want to tell your wife you're broke all the time. You want to save face, kidogo for your ego. I don't know. Like no, how does that absolutely. look? So, so let me tell you my no. personal experience, and I'll include also the experience of my friends. And and of course our elders. So there's 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 this African thing of we are not supposed to disclose to the wives um, what we have or what we earn. <laughs> and I also have friends who, if if when I tell them how I manage that, they're like, "Are you crazy? You should not do that." You know. So they'll always advise you and tell you, um, in terms of property, you can buy seven properties but only tell your wife about four you know then there are people who are open with their wives about everything then there are people who don't even tell their wives about any of the seven and you find someone who like i have a friend an older friend and he has like let's say out of 10 properties his wife knows about five he has a girlfriend who knows about two and then now the other girlfriend, three girlfriend, I'm a girlfriend i'm a girlfriend No, let me tell you. <laughs> so, I got I got this shocking realization that it's a thing. Okay. It's a thing. I was actually asked by some oh. girl about 2 3 weeks ago, like, are you married? Yes. And and uh, and you have a girlfriend. I'm like, "No, I'm married." She's like, "No, no, no. Yeah, I know you're married, but your girlfriend?" I'm like, "No, no, no. I'm married." She's like, "No, no, 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 no. You you know like it's a thing." So, Yeah so uh, uh, bold <laughs> men and married bold married men to go fashion <laughs> so um i think it's a very personal thing and it depends on your relationship with your yes, wife both. what 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 levels you are at um intellectually um what your relationship has been from the word go and also how you've both been brought up because you have to look at how your folks um treated uh, m- uh money and property between them and how her folks treated mm. money and property between them so for me if i can give if i can use me as an example i consider my wife even sharper than me mm-hmm. and so i'm very open with her about anything and yeah. everything because yeah. you'll find a situation where um she'll she'll have an idea of a better decision but also I think it's down to perception. Now w- I'm married and I have two kids. Now when it comes to money and property I I I look at her but I don't look at her as my wife. I look at her as the mother of my children. Mm-hmm. Because if anything god forbid was to happen to me Jeez. then she's the one to take care of these children yeah. so i don't want a situation whereby i go and i have something hanging somewhere that would have helped them but because i wanted to be a man and keep it away from her then the kids are suffering so at that point i look at her as mother of my children beautiful so lo i mean i agree 100% yeah. i mean if you if you if you look at them as because i know i know the philosophy is wide and far ranging mm. uh, around you know what's mine what's yours mm. i mean to me it's all it's just ridiculous yeah um so i i could answer that from from 
you know, advice coming from lessons learned about what happens in general. Mm. And I can also address it from my own personal perspective. Mm. Uh, you know, personally, my history with my wife is, is, is long and, and extremely uh, deep, I would say. I mean, we dated for 11 years. Um, for six of those years, I was an illegal immigrant in, in the U.S., because I couldn't, I couldn't be in school. I couldn't afford school fees anymore. Mm. So I dropped out and I, I spent six years trying to find a way to get back into school. Just never worked out. I ended up doing odd jobs as a waiter, uh, bus boy actually, which is a class lower than waiters. <laughs> bus boy. Mm. Bus boy. Basically, you research tables after mm. guests leave mm. for the waiter to serve the next guest. So mm. um, I, I discovered real estate investment during that period of time. And um, for a lot of that period, uh, she was very supportive. Uh, she did dump me once, but it had nothing to do with my financial status. I was just being non-committal mm. uh, on, on moving things forward. I mean, you dated, <laughs> you've dated for 11 years and at some 11 point, years, my niggas yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah, you're wondering, what's your rush? No, to give context, we, 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 we met in school. I mean, I wasn't yeah. in a position to mm. even consider that until we were both graduated. In theory, that was five years. He graduated, I didn't, which, which elongated the period yeah. of time yeah. for me to feel ready. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, she stuck with me, man. She supported me all through so personally for me i think very differently around how we manage the family's income today on on that backdrop you look know, at the family's wealth as she she's aware of everything mm. she and now especially as i as i get older I, f I feel the sense of urgency to ensure that she is aware of everything yeah. Because like Faki says, if something happens to me, I get raptured to heaven before the rest of you. Uh, <laughs> my kids need to have their fair shake at life yeah. and, and not go without whatever we have managed to build up until this point. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, but that's we'll... a very, yes, we, we've drafted one. Oh, nice. Uh, no, it scares me. But in, uh, in, in, in Islam, are you allowed to have a will? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it's, it's a dicey situation. So I... I, I, I deal with it different. I, I, I ensure that, especially when we are buying property, so it's in both our names, it just makes transfer um, easier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So a lot of stuff is just in both our names. Okay. I mean, I don't have much in terms of like properties, but yeah. yeah. Mm. That's beautiful. Mm. Well, my, 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 my wife is Tanzanian, so a lot of the properties I like, mm. she can't own. Oh. Because they're freehold agricultural oh. by law in Kenya, yeah. unless you're a Kenyan citizen, you cannot you own freehold agricultural land. Yeah. Oh. So those we own in a, in a, in a company name. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that has to be addressed you know, individually, mm -hmm. depending on your needs. Yeah. Uh, I actually believe uh, you know, your, your personal home, um, I think, is a good idea to, to be registered uh, in both your names up yeah. until a certain point. Mm. You know, if, if, you're, if you're considerably older than your wife mm. and you're likely going to be raptured to heaven before, mm. <laughs> before she, she does, then yeah. you, you, you don't want her dealing mm. with, with administration issues when you're yeah. gone. Yeah. So have the thing in her name mm. or, or even the kids' names. Mm. Uh, you know, so... Those are those are complex legal issues that someone has to get proper advice and counsel on. Yeah. But but they have to be conversations you have and and put in motion things to sort problems out. Yeah. In, in you know in the event that something does happen and that includes insurance. Mm. Man, I've been working with my wife for the last few years. Sorry, few days. Mm -hmm. It's been a month since we started working together. She's been helping me put together, manage, she's been helping me manage my entire operation for my solo project. Mm. And it's been the most rewarding experience ever. Mm. For real? Yeah, man. It's just yeah. made me like love her more, respect her more. And I feel like I'm living for something in terms of building a future, even if we don't have children yet. But I kind of know the future is going to be secure because we wake up every morning and we go and we grind. Mm. 
and I wouldn't see a scenario. I don't want to be in a situation where I own anything and she doesn't know. Like mm. that's very old fashioned. So in general, I think I'm for the school of thought. I think it's just dodgy. It's man. dodgy. It's just, mm. Hey, but you know people out here. What, what do we find your character development? <laughs> where you wanna? You know the guys here who've been developed. What, what's what's your? There's a question someone asked me. Like, how much will it take for you to to say you're retired? Not not yeah. meaning that you're bumming and sleeping all day and doing nothing. Yeah. Just meaning that <clears throat> I never have to work to get paid for my kids to have what they need, mm-hmm. you know, to, to <laughs> start their lives. I, I like, need a number. number. Do I need a number number? I, yeah, I think so. I mean, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Let yeah. me just be honest. A billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> a billion dollars. A billion dollars is good. I can't be an enemy of a billion dollars. A yeah. billion dollars. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, so I asked that because, you know, I'm 43 years old now. I'm one year younger than Faki, so uh, I'm in the middle. Uh, you're, 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 you're in the midlife crisis. <laughs> I mean, I, I think about this um, very often. You know, I have, most of my friends are about my age. Um, and we're having this conversation and... And the general agreement and consensus was, dude, you're 43, I'm 44, I'm 41, whatever. By the time we're 50, it's a wrap. Is it? In, in, terms, of, in terms of opportunity, energy, because, you know, mm. things change. Your view cha- changes. Your appetite mm-hmm. changes, mm. I- even in terms of risk. Mm. Um, you know, I, I had this chat with a very wealthy Kenyan gentleman years ago, just when we were starting the business. And he was asking me what we do. And I told him we sell land here, there, wherever, Nanyuki. And he said, how often do you go to Nanyuki or Naivasha? I'm like, at least two, three times a week, mm. you know, scouting, uh, prospecting, whatever. And he said, how old are you now? I was 36 at the time. And he said, hey, boss, you you need to... You need to make sure that by the time you're 40, you're not doing that anymore. And I asked him why. He said, because your body will start to feel those trips. Mm. You will have less tolerance for problems in the business. You know, right now you're optimistic, you're excited, you're starting something. You know, there are things you'll overlook, discomforts you ignore. Mm. But when you're 40, they become a problem. Mm. You'll have kids who need to be picked up from school. You won't have time to bounce to Nanyuki three times mm. a week. Uh, yeah. So yeah. put in place now mechanisms to free you from that mm. so that you, don't, you can still make the money and not have to do it. And I didn't understand what he meant until now. Mm. And so I find myself thinking about you know, those questions. So, so how much money will it take? Fine, I want to live in such a neighborhood. I want to drive such a car. I want my kids to go to such a school. I want to be in Diani once every month, you know, sleep in the sun and a, a tree, uh, doing nothing but eating and passing gas and <laughs> feel, feeling, feeling okay. You know yeah. what I mean? How much money will that take? And then once I arrived at the number, I actually started to feel like it's possible. Yeah. Because then you start to see where... I can do this, adjust that, cut this off, increase the other. And I don't think we map, when you're mapping success, we put figures. It's Even very, like so yeah. it's, it's one of the things I would say, um, I, we should have been taught in primary school. As how part to dream. Of, mm-hmm. How to dream, yeah. I mean, it's, it has to be quantifiable, otherwise you're, you're wasting time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's that corny saying, and it's corny for a reason, it's because it's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, that dreams without goals are nothing. Mm. You know, you, you, you need to put a deadline mm. to, to that dream. Mm. And so you put goals in place, things you have to do. Mm. Uh, I mean, sometimes it's, it's subliminal. You have a sense of urgency about something. You see opportunities and you go for them. Mm. <clears throat> but unless you have a target, then you'll find that by the time you're 50, and you haven't reached a target, you've lost the psych. Mm-hmm. You don't have the energy. Like, I'm driving to Nanyuki to 
to sit on a bench for three hours to beg a registrar to sign a title ah, mm. but that could that could have been the next two million dollars yeah mm. you know what i mean so mm. i feel like that that conversation has to be had mm. a lot more often issues around financial advisory i was asking um i tend to hang out with very loaded guys these days mm. and 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 girls mm. uh and you know i'm i'm not i'm not saying that to say anything about myself mm. i'm just fortunate to know to a lot of people mm. who are wealthy like proper wealth mm. you're talking about multi generational wealth mm. and i am i am deliberate about asking questions like uh how how did you plan mm. do you have a financial advisor i can talk to yeah because me i wasn't taught how to budget i'm i goofed and made mistakes al- along the way i sort of know what needs to be paid for before the other mm-hmm. yeah but how do i plan for my family how do i plan for school fees how do i plan for my grandkids mm-hmm. how do i plan for my aging parents mm-hmm. i'm the only son mm-hmm. you know their their well-being is my responsibility as well mm-hmm. how do i plan for them you know so I find like those conversations are not had enough at least not in public settings mm. um and you know for that I, I give you big ups for initiating this conversation hey, and I no, hope you I'm can, just trying you uh, can bring you can bring guys on board you know uh the manu chandarias and whoever you consider to have summited <laughs> to 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 advise yes yes because actually discussing money today First of all I realized that this cannot be a one episode conversation mm-hmm. because there's we haven't spoken about crypto yet we haven't spoken about stocks and the stock exchange market mm-hmm. we haven't spoken about so many things that all important yeah. are all important yeah. Yeah. because you know there's so many different revenue streams mm-hmm. so like as we wind up I want to ask the last question mm-hmm. what's your process how do you cut your hair <laughs> <laughs> I use a, okay I use a razor mm-hmm. um and I do it myself I used to go to the barber before but I find the commute sitting in a in a place sometimes is not very clean there's all sorts of characters you know in the barber shop yeah yeah you you and then the guy doesn't do it right so <laughs> I started doing it on my own so I use mm-hmm. you know I tried the machines they didn't they don't get close you know i like that smooth mm-hmm. you know it's a bit of overgrown at the moment i'm due for uh, a shave a but i do it i do it every other every other day in in my house hey, damn. and these days i don't even need a mirror i, I know, ah. you know i have the wrist action down <laughs> and uh, yeah and I still, i still go to the barber shop but i'm trying to be able to do that yeah. though my baba told Saves me a ton of money. no my baba told me and i don't know if it's his way of making sure i still go there uh. he told me i have the wrong grain of hair if i try the razor, razor. thing it'll bump yeah you know no, so i'm scared of BS, i'm scared dude. of that i i know it could be but i don't want to take the risk okay so it's like the big flex fight for you here but yeah. you can try it out okay you, yeah. you have to know your which way you your hair grains yeah so that you're not cutting against yeah. you know you have to cut along yeah but that you won't know until you do it enough and you understand how it, so most most of us we spiral i'm scared of that first time when then things will happen to my head and i can't go anywhere you know so for me i, I look at it as um it's an it's an opportunity to go to a baba shop and just get the, the experience the experience yeah. and just vibe with people yeah. you know you know actually um, i went to a baba shop the other day in tanzania because mm. i i get a baba who comes to my house and cuts my hair in the house mm. but i went to a baba oh, shop in tz and i enjoyed it mm. and i was like hey you know what was skill queenje pigo facial lapo it was a, it was like it was an experience and i think for me it's also being in the creative space it there's also some nuances you pick mm. from the baba shop just oh. how people are talking what mm. they are talking about mm. how they interpret the yeah. news and yeah. politics it's <laughs> very important you well. know like let me give you an example um you know the way in um, we hear about a scandal and we say um someone stole 5 billion shillings 
5B. 5B. Mm. You know, a lot of people don't, don't really understand the magnitude of 5B. And especially in Nairobi, we would say, you know, 5B can build us a certain road and, and mm. build this and this. The guy in Shags doesn't need that road. Mm. So he doesn't understand what you're complaining about. <laughs> Let me give you another, another, another scenario that I use to, to show how much a B is. If you had a billion shillings or dollars, whatever it is, and they were, in, they were denominated in one shilling coins, and you had to count from the first one to the last one, a billion, and let's assume... You're not sleeping, you're not eating, you're not... No, no, putting no breaks, nothing. No break, nothing. And you are counting at the rate of one shilling per second. Yeah. Do you know how much, how much time it would take you to, to finish one billion? Just guess, guess. A book rough is, guess. Just uh, rough guess. How billion, long it would take you to seconds. count? A billion seconds, six... Eight. It would take you 32 point something years. To count a billion. One shilling per second. One shilling per second. Wow. It would take you 32 plus years to count one billion. I mean, someone has done that five times. <laughs> yeah. Imagine. It's only 50 years. You know, I always, I always, and, and I'll, I'll put it out, out there now so that anyone can implement it because I've always thought that it would be good to sensitize people mm. about, and it comes back to, it's, it's about money. It's a money conversation. If, if we could be able to have um, um, like an exhibition of money in terms of, um, let's say, for example, Nyeri as a county. Let's just say it receives 20 billion a year. Mm -hmm. If we have a place in Nyeri in the middle of the town where what we do is we get pieces of paper that are the same size and and width and weight of a 1,000 shilling note. And we stack them up to represent that money. Wow, to show how much people To show are, how much how the county is. Then, yeah. every time something major happens, go and take that chunk of money and yeah. say, guys, look at this. You see this missing? Yeah. This is what this guy stole. I think people will appreciate <laughs> it more. And come election time, people will make better decisions, I think. Well, drops my guys, I have <laughs> gifts for you. And uh, these gifts are just from, you know, my lovely sponsors for the day. Thanks. And the bald men love the project. Uh, there's some whiskey in there. And of a he don't drink, by the way, so... My guests will take be happy. You always have it in your house, My guests will be very happy. When I come to your house, I drink it. Yeah. Yeah. When I come to your house, even when I go to your house, they're going to say, I'm happy, James and Young. And some Kipala culture, mm. you know, share butter. Asante, mm. boss. Thank you. 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 Thank you guys for coming nice. through. Like, thank you like, for having I can't us. Thank you, no? yeah, thanks for the privilege. Yeah. yeah. Like, nice to have that convo. Guys, yeah. uh, go check out Goshen Acquisitions. Okay. These guys are the best when you're trying to buy land in this like market. They have it down to the T. They are reliable and they're trustworthy. So we end up going with your materials and your fake in your They follow all the processes. They're amazing people. Please work with them. Mm. I have first-hand experience. And uh, Faki is a movie producer. He's he's done a movie that's on Netflix. So please tell them about the movie. Forty Sticks. But they are the on movie Netflix. Sticks. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's and uh, next year we are looking to shoot our second film. It's called To Asanda. Mm -hmm. uh, we're hoping to do it in the first half of the year and maybe uh, release it within the second half of the year. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to uh, some TV projects. I wish you well, bro. Thank you. Thank yeah, you, yeah, staff. Yeah. I wish you well. And also, like, I hope I, I can do the score for the movie. Yeah, I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. Okay, guys. <laughs> Bald man out. Cheers. <laughs>